There you go. Okay, there is this screen with a uh, live sentence pop in. Okay, so hello guys. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking your time, uh, first of all, and joining that um, that call. Um, I really appreciate that. So, quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Jakob. I work in Warsaw in, at for Finance IT. That's where I met Martin, by the way. And Martin, thanks to you for organizing that. And um, this presentation will be held in, at uh, Warsaw Cloud Native Meetup in roughly two weeks uh, from now. Um, so if you have any suggestions, any remarks, thoughts, uh, just feel free to interrupt me. Or um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop in uh, because any thoughts might be highly appreciated uh, and any feedback would be cool. So uh, at that meetup, Warsaw Cloud Native meet Meetup, we are expecting uh, some less experienced audience when it comes to uh, event sourcing and when it comes to CQRS and SpringStream. Um, that is why today I will shortly uh, go through the introduction part and I won't be talking how event sourcing is cool and how uh, we can go back in time and how we can debug our software. I will try to, to, to focus on some less common benefits that this kind of architecture can give us. Um, but also kind of cool ones. Um, uh, so, okay, let's get it started. I will share my, my screen with you. Okay, I hope it works. Can anyone confirm that? Yes. Cool. Um, so, uh, first I would start with this, uh, with, the, with the short story about ORNs on, for example, about Hibernate. So, there is this feature built in uh, most of ORMs, for example, in Hibernate, which is uh, called dirty checking. So um, to roughly explain that, um, this feature um, allows Hibernate to deduct which changes are being done to our domain objects and uh, which should be reflected in the database statements. So by um, comparing two states of our domain objects, the one at the beginning of our transaction stored in a snapshot and uh, at the end of the transaction, uh, it can uh, generate some small changes to our domain objects. Um, I like to call those, uh, those changes um, small deltas of our domain objects. Uh, so these figures uh, are Greek letters deltas, not like Martin suggested, uh, they are hangers, they, they are deltas. So um, to, to, to show it, um, in real life, um, I have this small application uh, created. Um, it uh, creates a new shop item with a status of ordered and then sets status to paid uh, and then saves it again. So if I run this uh, this, uh, this test and uh, I have this HQL journal enabled, I can see that my Hibernate generated two kind of deltas to my database layer, one being the insert, which is equivalent of this line, and one being the update statement, which is equivalent of this line. There is also the um, uh, select statement in between, but that's not relevant it's because uh, there is merge called in between uh, those two calls. Um, so what I would like to say here is that um, when Hibernate loads an object from, uh, from the database, it, um, it uh, loads the state from the database and then it uh, um, invokes our empty constructor in our entity and populate all the fields by, for example, reflection or, or, or setters. But um, we cannot say something like, dear Hibernate, please load me an object, but please take into account only this one delta and ignore the latter one. So we cannot do that. Um, also, if we think about it, if we think about those deltas, um, those small uh, changes to our, um, to our domain, um, without them, nothing would really work in our application because we wouldn't be able to persist anything. So they really control our business and they really control the, the fact that we can support business needs because they, uh, they made persistence available for us. So these are reflecting SQL statements. But as I mentioned, we cannot just uh, ask Hibernate to load a couple of them because it always aggregates states in the database. Uh, so if we want, uh, if we wanted, uh, for example, to 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 build our mechanism of of those deltas on our own, uh, we could do that uh, in the following way: we would have to teach our application uh, how to uh, produce deltas uh, as a result of, for example, business method being called on our domain object, and we we should also 
teach this engine how to interpret those, those deltas when they are met, for example, uh, during, the, during the loading from the persistence mechanism. So uh, that way we could have two things. We could, um, we could go back in time and load a particular set of deltas and we can have our deltas as our first class citizens of our domain. So we could control them, we can see them. Actually, they are very crucial to our application. So let's see how this shop item would look like in event source uh, domain. I have this small project, and by the way, all of the code that I'm showing right now, it's available at my GitHub account. There will be a link at the end of this presentation. So um, that, yeah, that's it, that's, that, that's about it. Um, we have this shop item, and as I said, the result of business method being called would be a new delta that we can uh, create in that way, uh, like new item paid. So it's a result of this method being called and uh, it's, um, it's being stored in the internal list of changes in this shop item. Uh, what's important here and what's, uh, what's event sourcing uh, gives us in that particular scenario is that if we take a look at this class, we don't see anything related to any framework except for Lombok, because uh, I like Lombok. And uh, we don't have any Hibernate mappings uh, and uh, crazy annotations and so on and so forth. So that means we can do pure object-oriented programming here without even thinking about how it's going to be mapped to relational model. That would mean that we are able to, to avoid this impedance mismatch between those two words and we can program uh, our domain however we want without trade-offs. And domain is not a good place to do trade-offs, right? So. Um, for example, we can we can uh, we can set up our domain object to be completely immutable. Like here, we can have final fields, and uh, every time we change something, we can return new object with uh, with new new change. Uh, that wouldn't be possible with uh, with um, with Hibernate because it requires this empty constructor. It cannot has it cannot have um, final fields in our entities if we want to if we want to to use Hibernate. Um, but it goes far beyond that, because uh, let's go back for, for a while to this example of Hibernate. If we do something like this here, um, let's say status, for example, cancel, uh, and if we run it, uh, we're going to see that Hibernate um, generated the same set of deltas as it had before. So still, we have one insert statement and one update statement, even though we had made uh, an additional change to our domain object here and here. With Hibernate and any other ORMs, we're going to lose data. We're going to lose information about facts that happened in our domain. Whereas in event sourcing, it's not possible because every, every single call to our domain object is going to store a new delta or let's start calling it domain event uh, in our list of changes. Uh, so first of all, we can go back in time, we can have uh, um, this, those deltas as first class citizens of our domain, we can control them. Uh, we don't lose information and we can uh, avoid the impedance mismatch between object-oriented world and relational world in, in, um, in databases. Um, so <clears throat> there's one more thing, um, there's one more thing uh, about that, because I mentioned that uh, we need to uh, to to somehow teach our engine how to mm, produce deltas, and we are doing that here. But we also need to teach it um, how to deal with uh, loading those deltas and um, creating an object. So actually, it's pretty pretty easy because <clears throat> I can code something like that. I can say that anytime I I meet this delta item paid, which is equivalent of this delta, um, I can change my state to uh, to some other one. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, this construction, is it comes from uh, Lombok Wiffer. Uh, it's actually a convenient way of creating uh, an immutable object with one property change. So um, out of the box, I have generated a couple of uh, helper methods, which goes like this, with state with changes for any other field I have here. Uh, so I'm mutating this, I'm not mutating this state, but I'm creating new object with one property, property being changed. 
so um, uh, deltas, but we I didn't mention how to actually store them. So um, if we think about it, we could store them uh, anywhere we want. We could, for example, store them in a, on a disk file, or we can we can store them um, in a relational database. Um, uh, we can store them anywhere. The, the important fact is that uh, we need to somehow uh, separate deltas that are um, that are um, that are that, that that go together, deltas that go together for a single domain object instance. So, for example, if I want to have uh, a shop item with the ID number three, I need to gather all the deltas uh, that uh, are related to the ID number three. And that way I can do this um, state reconstruction, uh, which is called event sourcing, right? So I know that, that uh, state two is exact state one plus de delta number two applied. Uh, so in other words, or in um, functional programming words, um, uh, any state at the point e X is left fault of the deltas that happened before x and uh, that's pretty much about um, that's pretty much it about event sourcing it's uh, not a new idea um, and the important stuff uh, in that is that um, the client of, this, of that code so for example a client of that uh, um, application or programmer who tries to, to pop in into the project um, not this one um, that one. Sure. Okay, so it doesn't need to even know that this shop item is in fact underneath um, even sourced because that's why we have uh, famous repository patterns, right? So if I take a look at the repository for uh, for this uh, shop item, I will see that it looks like in traditional repository it has method uh, method for saving an instance and for getting by ID. But the implementation is kind of different. So uh, by saving, I mean getting all of the changes that are still there in my shop item. So I'm going to this list of changes, and I'm storing them in the event store. After all, I'm saying that I'm done with that, so I can mark my, my shop item instance and flash all the changes, so make the list empty. Same with... Um, with loading the shop item from event store, it's also kind of easy because we uh, we need to to load only this event stream. Uh, so we need to take um, items uh, deltas that are related to this particular shop item and do this left fold of the initial state. So um, that's pretty pretty much about it. Um, I would um, uh, want to focus more about. Um, focus on um, testing and um, DDD and Spring Stream, and I would like to present you uh, one excerpt of code um, that's, that's, that's here. So oftentimes I see people that do DDD and um, about that context with microservices, um, they often use this, this famous pattern for of the main events in order to collaborate between uh, between two uh, bounded context um, by the by the way of of, of the main events uh, and that's 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 pretty awesome it works uh, but it has uh, some issues uh, if we think about it here uh, we are mutating a state um, of our product by changing its price and then we are saying to other contexts um, that new price was assigned but we can easily make make a mistake here because we can create this domain event in an incorrect way. We can put different price in here, an actual price that was here. <clears throat> the ground for this problem is that we are working with two set, with two kinds of deltas here. One of them being the delta uh, represented by hibernate, which will be then executed as SQL statement. And the other one, handily made by us, that we are uh, publishing to other bounded context. That is not possible with, uh, with event sourcing uh, because we can, we can easily publish uh, the same deltas that are building our shop item. So we can publish those deltas to, uh, to other contexts. And that way, we cannot lie because this is, this is only one, one kind of delta, right? 
of course, we can um, we can think about this scenario, and we could, for example, unit test this behavior, and we could we could say, okay, I can write a unit test that would check that the, the domain even uh, being published is uh, with the correct price, the same as here. That would require us additional work, of course. With event sourcing, we have it for free. And speaking about unit testing, um, a basic unit test for that. Uh, would look, for example, like this. Um, if we take a look at that and think about it, we are having an initial state uh, of our shop item. We are changing something and check what's what's there as a result. So we are actually testing here those deltas that are being then uh, translated to SQL statements and um, executed against our data source. So. That's not a big mind shift when it comes to event sourcing because in event sourcing we can we can test our domain model like this and we also test here the deltas that the effect of our business method being called. So uh, the mind shift is uh, not that big here. Um, I mentioned that we can store we can store um, this um, those. The, this event store can be implemented uh, on a disk file in a relational database. Um, so I here propose really simple um, database for, for, for storing uh, those events, uh, which has two tables, one of, the, one of which is event stream, which uh, holds a collection of event descriptors for particular um, domain instance or oh, domain object instance. Mm -hmm. So Loading an object from uh, from th this database would require to, to fetch um, particular event stream and get all of the events, so get all of the deltas. Um, but there is there is one thing that um, is problematic with this scenario, because what if we want to, um, for example, uh, fetch all the shop items that have uh, price, let's say, bigger than one thousand pounds. Uh, that would require us in this particular architecture and in this scenario that would require us to load all of the events that I have in my event store, recreate all of the uh, all of the um, shop items out uh, from these events uh, and then filter out those which meet the given criteria. Um, that would mean that I would have to do full table scan on event table uh, every time I want to query anything from my domain, um, that wouldn't be, of course, uh, that efficient. Um, that's why people came up with, uh, with CQRS. And I want to show you how it goes really cool with, uh, with Springstream and with uh, event sourcing, um, because I can have a um, different model from reading from, um, than from writing. And this, this read model can be built upon facts that are in my event store. And those facts can be published um, to my other application that is responsible for, for the read site uh, by the means of Spring Stream. So I can directly publish my changes, my deltas, to a message broker, which will in turn uh, publish that to all, all of the subscribers. And the cool thing about that, I will show the code of this uh, this shop UI. The cool thing about that um, is that when I'm listening to those events, I can have different read model updater implementations. So uh, I can set up three different projections because th these are called projections of, of the event stream um, at the same time. So I could, uh, for example, uh, have one application which goes to the relational database by GDBC, like this one, but I could have another one uh, deployed uh, with different consumer group ID, like, for example, UI-Neo4J, uh, 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 that would have different kind of, um, different kind of uh, read model updater. And uh, I could have the third one, which would go to, uh, in memory, and the cool thing about that is they can treat events as they want. So let's actually uh, generate some random events to see that in uh, in action. Um, so I'm going to 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 just send some random comments to uh, to this application, uh, to the shop application. 
um, every five seconds I'm going to to order something and pay for, some, for something and I'm backed uh, underneath uh, by, by Kafka by the way um, and everything is connected by the means of uh, Spring Stream um, so I hope it works let's see oh yeah it's sending some uh, some messages and now if we start uh, our shop item um, with this consumer group ID um, UI the first one it goes to the relational database I can uh, I could start fetching the events um, the cool thing about that is that those projections those data sources neo4j um, fi disk files or the relational databases can be at the same place as the application itself so for example the application can write and read from a disk that is actually deployed at so the um, the round uh, round trip time it's going to be really quick in that scenario so i'm, I'm receiving uh, those events every five seconds here uh, i can run different um, uh, different projection let's say it's going to be neo 4j um, and i'm going to, to to see the events here as well um, and by by uh, by doing this uh, this um, by playing with this consumer group um, ID, I can do several several nice stuff because if I deployed, my, for example, three or more applications uh, with different uh, with different consumer group ID, um, I can do horizontal scaling of my read side uh, of the application. And that's pretty much cool because um, there's oftentimes a problem when our application, our database uh, load is 90% reads and 10% of writes to our applications. And people tend to, to, to um, create a third normal form in, a, in their databases. And this form is uh, pretty much optimized for write sites, not for, for the read sites. And um, by doing CQRS with the help of the Spring Stream, uh, we can do uh, our read side um, denormalized and however we want. So uh, I was saying that we can um, we can run, uh, for example, with different kind of UI uh, with different kind of consumer group subscriptions uh, to have this horizontal scaling uh, of our our of our application. But I can run uh, free version of free free instances of my software with the same consumer group ID, and I can easily have uh, the failover mechanism for free. Because uh, when one of them goes down, the other one will will, will take over. So um, if I go to the the shop uh, project one more time, I can also um, code that uh, in the properties that it's uh, going to partition the load, right? Uh, for example, by UID. So I can still, um, for example, um, distribute particular shop items to, for example, projection, which is based on Neo4j, and the other one, which is based on this file, and so on and so forth. So by changing only one property um, in SpringStream, this one, I can uh, do partitioning, I can do failover, I can do horizontal asymmetric scaling. It's asymmetric because I'm scaling um, the read side irrespectively of the right side because I'm not even touching the, the, the right side because, uh, because I don't need it. Because maybe my application has, uh, my, da my database is uh, loaded with reads, so I need more reads. Um, the, the cool thing about that is, um, is when actual new business requirement comes in Let's say we have a, this new requirement that pops in. Our product manager comes to our office and, and says to us, you know what? I would like you to, in this uh, user interface project, in this user interface website or whatever it is, I would like you to start showing price of our shop items because you know what? It's nice to have um, a price uh, next to the shop items you are displaying. Um, so let's say we are coding that uh, to make it quickly. I have it on my branch. It's a few lines of code. Uh, we'll check it out. Um, let's say I coded it and uh, I want to deploy it. So I can, I can for instance, uh, assign it a different new um, consumer group ID like UI dash experimental. Um, we run it uh, with the new version of the software. 
let's say here. And the cool thing about that is by uh, thanks to Springstream, um, I just created a durable subscription. That means that uh, my application will be backed by all of the historic events that were there from the beginning of time, as we can see here. Um, that goes far beyond that because we are having now um, supplication of the historic data, which keeps receiving the live data as well. Um, side by side with the old version of our software. That means that we can test our software uh, on a production environment with the historic data and with the live data as well. So I cannot think literally about any better way of testing our software than running it on production with historic and live data because it, we cannot go beyond that, right? Um, but let's say that something, uh, something something went, went wrong with our um, with our implementation of this um, of this price feature let's say that one week from now one week after deployment uh, we made a, uh, we discovered a bug um, we discovered a bug and uh, our projection our database is desynchronized everything crashed and nothing works so what I can do about that is I can mm, I can um, rerun the old version of our software, which is still there, by the way. Uh, I can uh, stop this one uh, and repair the bug uh, by doing some uh, some pull requests, for example. Um, and I can um, basically drop the whole database because it's it's crashed, it's, it's, it's destroyed, it's desynchronized. So um, I can drop the projection um, and with the help of Springstream, I can um, I can do that with two lines of properties. Um, I have it here as well. So we have it. This we have this uh, um, this um, this property which says that I'm going to reset my offset in Kafka. That would mean that I'm saying to Kafka, you know what? I want to reconsume all of the events. Uh, I want to reset my projection to, to the point of zero. So please give me my events one one more time. So I can um, I can rerun it, and I will see that all of the events will be um, provided to me from the beginning of the time. So by doing um, those, by playing with those uh, offsets and with those consumer group IDs uh, in Springstream, we actually implemented um, um, blue-green deployments of, a, of new features of database. We can run our software side by side and do releases side by side uh, instead of going, for example, Big Bang release. And if uh, if anything goes wrong, we can always roll back our changes and go back in time and uh, repair that and recreate the state from the, from the scratch. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, I didn't mention that we can, of course, uh, leave both of them uh, on production environments. So this one, the price feature, and the, uh, the old one without the price feature. Um, that would mean that, for example, we can have a round robin between them and do A-B testing. So this this is for free in CQRS with, with Springstream. Um, this goes for free uh, only by manipulating some properties. And I think this is tremendous software, um, Springstream. And uh, together with, with CQRS, it, it goes really well. Um, it goes really well. Uh, so I would like to, to, to uh, talk more uh, about uh, performance of this kind of applications. So there is always the the, the uh, people are worried about um, about uh, projections, about um, highly crowded event streams, and recreating those uh, states from those highly crowded event streams. Um, but there is this uh, concept of of rolling snapshot that uh, people developed. So I'm not going to talk about that. It's pretty much solved. Uh, I would like to focus on other other stuff. Uh, we mentioned that this um, um, this this event store can be can be um, backed by files on disk or relational database. 
Uh, let's focus, for example, on an, uh, on this on this on, on disk files. If we think about it for for a while, um, this uh, excuse me, not that one. Uh, this um, um, this stream of events that we have here, it's an uh, append only structure of immutable events. So if I, if I, for example, serve my event store via HTTP server, uh, that would mean that I can tell um, that I can tell uh, any node in my network that you know what, if you once get that event, it won't change. So you can set your cache ability to basically to, to forever. You can cache forever. You don't need to invalidate your cache. That's a pretty much good uh, performance boost. But uh, talking about those disk uh, disk files, if we store it uh, on a disk, and uh, knowing that this is an uh, append only structure of immutable events that we are only reading uh, in chunks in sequence, for example, from the top till the half or from the top till the end, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that uh, the disk uh, disks are really much uh, faster than uh, when they are reading sequentially. Um, whereas uh, when they read uh, when they read randomly, it's going to be much slower. So we can take uh, advantage of that, and it comes for free. Um, there is one uh, one bottleneck with that uh, with what I proposed because um, we have this um, this event store as this um, uh, as this relational database model, and then we have uh, we have uh, this background thread which actually goes and checks uh, whether there are some events uh, that need to be uh, published uh, to the spring spring stream channel um, so this might be might be um, a bottleneck um, in highly crowded event stream uh, I, I had this this uh, this setup on production in quite i must say i must say quite crowded environment it haven't caused us any problems so far so fingers crossed yeah. um, but it might be it might be a problem um, okay let's um, go back to the to the slides for a while um, so we mentioned about uh, horizontal asymmetric scaling failover ab testing blue green deployments partitioning adding new service or new feature performance and now i'd like to focus for a while, um, about and talk about testing. So normally, um, I tend to uh, test this kind of ecosystems uh, like the following. So I can create uh, a new Spring Stream application that would connect to um, my channels. One of them would be command channel. The other one would be events channel. And uh, I can treat my whole ecosystem as a black box. And my new application uh, would be a probe uh for that ecosystem and would throw uh, some commands at it and see what events are being generated as a um, as a result of that black box that would be pretty much good uh, that is pretty much good uh, end to end test uh but we can do better we can do uh something like that for example we could store all of the commands that are being executed on our production environment throughout a week let's say and when we are developing a new feature, um, we can we can have a new version of our, of our software. We can uh, rethrow those gathered command um, at new version of our of our software, and compare uh, the output, uh, the events that are uh, there as an output with the output that was there uh, one week ago. That would be a pretty much good regression test for our systems. But we didn't break anything, right? There are some pitfalls with this kind of uh, architecture, of course. Um, so um, there's not much much sense uh, in doing that that kind of architecture when we are we are uh, developing CRUD based applications. So when our application really supports those four functions, and that's how people use them uh, use it. Um, it wouldn't make 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 sense to to create event sourcing because Hibernate will will do better and and faster, right? And there is too much burden to to and too too big mind shift to to bother. Uh, the other one is to, um, that um, when, for example, 
our application uh, does not care on our of our or our business um, um, business problem and uh, does not care about historic da data. Um, in that way, we also don't, don't need event sourcing as well. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, um, and uh, people are, are always confused about that, because um, we mentioned this resetting offset in, in Kafka, for example, that would uh, mean dropping a projection and replaying the event so that the projection can be can be uh, can be recreated. So um, in this part, um, there is always uh, the question that pops in. What if my event handler in my projection? Uh, what if it does um, um, some um, side effect, right? Like calling SMS service or something like that? Of course, we can handle that with, uh, for example, having an important um, service provider, uh, SMS service provider. But what if we if we we have to pay for every call to them anyway? So um, there must be a better way uh, for doing that. Uh, for example, um, people try to solve it like this, that um, we are saving an intent of SMS being requested uh, to our internal database, right? And then we are processing uh, this database and calling this SMS service and deleting those requests in order to, to avoid two-phase commit. But uh, if we think about it for a while, um, we are storing that in a internal database and we are replaying uh, our events because probably we, we we have to be prepared for that we lost everything that is in our database so those um, those intents might might not be there while replaying that would mean that we are calling um, this sms service each time we are replaying so it doesn't uh, doesn't solve our issue um unless unless those um, those SMS requested events or intents would be stored uh, in some safer place, in some place that would uh, not change and would be uh, the one and only source of truth for our application. Um, for example, event store, right? So we can introduce uh, those events in our event store and by calling SMS service, we can, after calling, we can, we can save a new event to our SMS sent, and uh, in the end, we are introducing here something which is called a process manager in DDD terms. Um, that is a uh, first class citizens of DDD uh, applications, um, just as aggregates are uh, or bounded context. Um, so we can recreate its state based of based of uh, on based on what is in the event store even so we move the problem of uh, replaying the projection to actual recreating state of our uh, domain object and actually um, this happens uh, frequently that we want to uh, to store this sms request and, and immediately call um, sms service because we don't want to uh, to wait for the background thread uh, that comes in um, for example, we could we could solve it uh, with having um, Rx Java and two observable observables that would be merged. But uh, it's so common problem that, for example, um, I don't know if you guys have ever used ACA persistence and a persistent actor model, but they solve it uh, in a way that um, we are able to 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 fire uh, um, a callback that might of course fail just after acknowledging a message. Uh, so we are storing something. And um, there is another parameter with the callback, which would be run after all. And it, it can, of course, fail. But when we are recreating um, our state, this was saved. So we know that if we are too long in some particular state, we probably have to, uh, have to recall that service in order to wait for, for that message. So this is for free, for example, in uh, ACA event sourcing and their journal. But um, I, I think it would be pretty cool to have something like that uh, in, in Spring Stream. Um, this is, of course, a, a, rough, a rough proposal uh, that would um, run um, a callback um, after acknowledging a message. And that callback, of course, wouldn't be run while replaying events. So that's just a proposal, but uh, this is more or less how they uh, how they managed to do that uh, in uh, in ACA. Um, yeah. So 
that's about it. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, if you have any, any feedback, any questions, uh, positive or negative, um, I'm here. Um, and you can also drop me a line um, here or, or ask me on, on Twitter. And here is the, the, the code of the, the, those three or four applications that, I, that I've showed um, during this talk. So thank you one more time. Thank you, Martin, for organizing that. And um, hope to talk you, to you soon. So actually, if somebody has questions right now, I mean, it's a good time. Someone's unmuted because I'm hearing some voices from the background. Yeah, I have a question actually. Um, Sorry, this is my microphone is actually quite awful. Um, yeah, I can hear you right now. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, my question was: uh, Have you considered, for example, running like running this through a repository abstraction in and by itself? I mean, that's one of the one of the things that we're considering, sort of uh, as a model design for. Uh, so instead, kind of adding another abstraction layer on top of the stream listener that handles the events and handling them automatically into an aggregating repository and the command repository, that kind of, uh, that kind of operation. Uh, I'm not sure if I get that. Um, what do you mean by this another layer of, of, of abstract repository? Basically having a, having a repository that publishes events rather than storing them into a database. So ah, just, okay. you, you know what I mean? So instead of saving Locally, just publishing things. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. But, um, yeah. The problem is that um, we need two things, right? We need to store somehow our um, our event, and we need to publish them um, to other subscribers. So, uh, with database, we cannot, of course, have both of both of that because we cannot like uh, have subscription and uh, in in databases. Uh, so, for uh, in order to do that, we would need like uh, uh, some predefined. Uh, event store like getEventStore.com that is done by Greg Young and his crew uh, because it supports both operations, uh, subscriptions and, and saving because we need both, right? We need to publish the events and we need to like um, recreate states, so we need to load them. Uh, and by the way, I think that um, um, Kafka wouldn't be good for that uh, because um, that would require us to have uh, uh, Kafka topic for each instance of our um, domain object uh, in order to, to, to fetch events from particular topic, right? So if we had like topics for um, shop items, um, only for shop items, and then we want to, 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 to recreate some state, um, that would require us to filter out those uh, events that are not related to, to the certain ID. Um, of course, we can we can deal with that by having partitions uh, and have like a base modulo calculating. But still, we need to filter out some um, some um, uh, some events in our application. Uh, that's why I don't think Kafka is a good, a good example of uh, of event store. Contrary to what it said, said what is being said in in the in the documentation of it. Although it's a great way of transporting uh, those data. Okay, cool. Uh, sure. I was actually thinking of something that uh, basically like having an application publish events and basically other applications sort of re-aggregating them on the other end. But uh, I see what you're saying. But what, um, where would you store it? Uh, because if you just publish them, uh, we need somehow to, to recreate state. So mm -hmm. we still need some place to from which we can load those those events, right? Right. Yeah, I was thinking it it could be a separate microservice that does that. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. So different event yeah. store. Yeah. Again, this is yeah. Up. Yeah. No, but kind of moving the concept into a different app. So anyway, it's it it's actually like, this is great stuff actually. So I really like it. Thank you very much. The question is it's really good. Uh, I was thinking about about that uh, and. Uh, my future work will be regarding that, so we'll be uh, probably connecting some predefined event store for that. And 
how we just described in the separate uh, report, uh, separate microservice for gathering mm -hmm. uh, events. Yeah, I've asked you this board before the call, but uh, I think this would make a great contribution as a general purpose uh, framework for building this type of kind of application, kind of an extension to Spring Cloud Stream. So if you were considering doing that, I certainly encourage you to do so. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's going to be great stuff, a great thing to have. Why not? It's not, not going to be easy, but it's something that uh, I think it will be beneficial. Jakob, you could do that for the cl cloud native meetup. That would be awesome to already present that. I'm not, of course, uh, pre uh, putting any pressure on you, obviously. Yeah. So I have like, um, <laughs> but it will be off. Just did. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I never do it. <laughs> That's cool. Let's start now. Yeah, I think. Cool. I, I have one question. Yep. Um, you showed um, when you when you. Uh, Start to write up a new version of the app with a different group ID. So you're relying on Kafka uh, replaying all the events, right? From from the beginning of time. Well, at some point, you know, if you're going to use uh, log compaction, then you're going to lose events. So, I, I mean, what, what's the situation there? I mean, I don't, don't you really need to keep the the stateful, you know, the complete object in Kafka, so that so that so that the latest one is always available. I mean, how do you do? There are some strange uh, noises in the background. I really don't. Uh, I'm not sure if I if I got your question. You ask whether um, uh, whether in Kafka I can store my messages forever. Was that uh, the question or not? Well, yeah. I mean, you showed that they were being replayed uh -huh. when you started a new group ID, and. Uh -huh. That, that wouldn't be the case over a long extended period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's true. Although the documentation says that we can we can store them forever, but uh, pretty pretty much in some really high high um, crowded traffic, at, at some point would have problems with, uh, with uh, at least with the, with the uh, disk persistence, right? But I think that um, uh, you can you can um, you can. Uh, say to Kafka that uh, do not delete any of my messages, and I can just add uh, more disks uh, in order to keep to keep more more events. In some scenarios, um, in some scenarios, I can. Uh, there is there is something which is called uh, um, events archive or something like that. It would mean that, for example, uh, after some period of time when I don't need relevant uh, data, like for example. Uh, at the end of the year, um, I'm in accounting. I'm 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 closing a year, so I don't need this data. So I can archive this um, this um, this stuff and those events that were there throughout all of the year and start a new event store. Um, but I think it's uh, really specific to, to the business we are trying to solve. I think another another option there would be to use snapshotting. All right. And, yeah. uh, and make sure that so you know that you have certain events since a certain snapshot has been taken and basically ditch everything that's been uh, processed until then. Like if you're 100 percent safe that um, your um, your snake like your snapshot is correct. Yeah, you you could do that. You could do that. I think in most scenarios, um, the more uh, more disk more disks would be uh, the best options because uh, this is cheap, right? But the snapshot uh, proposal is a really good one. Yeah, I think okay. the snapshot is also kind of a valid thing because, <clears throat> like, replaying the everything that happened since the beginning of time is not like it's it's basically a linear increase mm -hmm. of the number of events that you have to process. So it's unrealistic that you'll ever have a case where you process like ten years worth of data reliably and fast. So probably well, having I, I, some kind of intermediate yeah, signal would help. That was really my thought: is that you could, from time to time, store the 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 object in a compact in, in a in a in a Kafka topic that's got log compaction going on, so that so that you will you'll always you know at some point in time you can and that would really be a snapshot. You know, you write that lot to the log, and then you know you you know long to need those old events. Yeah, I think I think you can do that. Like snapshotting is basically a kind of a concept in like in CQRS and events tracing. 
So it's sort of a kind of a first class citizen and definitely you can say like it's oh, like you can basically like reason around the sequence and maybe attach some information to the events that help you kind of when you reconstruct you know what you have to ignore and what you don't. Oh, it is open source. But yeah, it's, I think it's a matter of design. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay, I, I, I think we don't have any more questions. So thank you guys one more time for listening and taking your time and finding uh, time in your schedules. Okay, so I guess I have to click stop transmission. So I'm clicking that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot both for doing this.